Thank you, Sarah, and thank, hi everyone, thanks for coming along. Um, I hope you're all well rested after yesterday. I'm going to be putting in lots of content as usual, lots of intense ideas. Don't try to absorb it all. Um, there will be a recording afterwards, and if there's too much information on the slides, just go back and um, you can pause and take to eat, read it at your leisure. There's a lot of depth. I try and provide so much that you can come back to um, and really sort of study in more detail later if you want to. But I'm going to be giving the overview as we go. So preamble here, um, how, how to save psychological type. It's something that flexes me and, and um, is on my mind a lot of the time. Um, some of the thoughts I've had recently, you know, save the essence, discard the form. You know, there's, there's some really important ideas psychologically within in type that I think are not really integrated within other areas, especially of personality or, or of other areas of psychology currently. Um, and I think they need to be saved. And um, this, this, you know, things can take different forms, there's certain ways we've used things, the way they've been presented. You know, it doesn't have to be held onto. We can, we can we can change that over time. Um, the idea uh, scientifically is to build testable propositions for me from the ground up, you know, not to just build on existing ideas and interpretations of Jung or, or otherwise, or Jung's interpretation of psychology. It's like to look back to the ground of wherever you can and, and then build propositions that can then be tested and developed. Um, and to question existing interpretations in, in detail, you know, like the MBTI model, like other models, um, they're all models. So we've got to just look at them for what they are and, and, um, and, and question them. Uh, so I want to encompass Jung and the hundred years of psychology since. We've got, we're amazing, an amazing position today that we, we, we can have those ideas and a hundred years of stuff to look at as well and work with it all together. It's, it's you know, we're really lucky and have all the technology have it all at our fingertips online. It's like no other era. Um, so some areas I'm going to cover today are types of what, abstract components, and consciousness. Um, just some of the areas that may be involved in this. So the types of what. Um, I think it's really important to be clear in what we're defining when we use the word type. I think that's one of the most um, distracting things that, that has caused us issues. And um, when we're looking at these different ways we can use the word type, like types of what? So Jung's eight psychic functions, as he called them, are like basically types or modes or domains of mental processing. That's the first what. It's the types of mental processing. Um, and that leads us to what you might call today a cognitive architecture. And in a sense that when we've got the question, does type change? That it doesn't change in that, well, it may do over millions of years as, as the human race evolves, but essentially the sort of foundational architecture or structure of the, the mind and, and the related, related brain, you know, they're kind of basically there in the same way that human physical form is, is fairly similar or the same or similar across the human race. You know, we have these ways that we, we've evolved a, a common basis. And then you've got this, Within that system of these, these mental processes, you've got what Jung talks about is the habitual one-sidedness, the attitudes, the, the, the predominance of some or one over the others. And that's what I call a type of tendency or bias. Now, it's people, some people didn't like the word bias when they use it, because they see bias as always a negative thing, but it doesn't. Like, in a system, it's just like a bias just means it kind of pulls in one direction um, by default. Of conscious awareness. So conscious awareness has a slight tendency or bias in one direction um, in this system overall of processes. And you could call that a type of psychological organization. Um, Jack Block, who's a psychologist, if you look at his work, he, he's saying, well, we should be open to that type as, as, a, as types of psychological organization. Um, so I call it ipsative, that's just ranked within the person, priority or dominance. An interesting thing about this kind of one-sidedness types of one-sidedness is that you can look at it over different time periods. If you look in a state, in the moment, you can say, okay, um, right now, my, my introverted feeling pr pr function process is, is dominant over everything else. Um, but then another moment, another one might be dominant. So th this, the idea of attitude is, is a state phenomenon uh, that I think it is anyway. And then, You've got the broader times and you can you can choose your time basis over what, what you look at 
um, you could say this week, this month, this year, this whatever, you know, what is my overall tendency or bias within that time? Then you're sampling individual moments across a whole period. Well, they would be if you're doing it systematically, but generally we just have a kind of general hunch that that's how it is. And that's how most questionnaires and personality work. Um, so then the third type is types of developmental pathway. And that's what I think the 16 MBTI types are. The idea that they're, and they're not just necessarily a, a behavioral pathway, that, that they're more of a dispositional pathway. They're like templates that are hypothetically balanced um, you know, between the sense of introversion, extroversion, uh, 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 rational and irrational functions, for instance. And the idea of being that these developmental pathways, you know, sort of this early days, like in our youth, this tendency over a longer period of time, like pulling us towards developing a dominant superior function and an auxiliary function. And that regardless of how we actually developed, that it's recognizing that that pathway was there underlying what was going on. That's what we're often trying to do is help people unpick that behavior versus um, disposition. And we're working with types. So that's three types of what. It's really important to be clear about, we can use the word type for either of these things. Um, and, and importantly, like this, you know, the second type, the habitual one-sidedness, sorry, the, <laughs> the state one-sidedness obviously changes in the moment, from moment to moment. It, the, the types of development, developmental pathway, um, I don't think they do change because if we, his history doesn't change, the past doesn't change, time goes forward. So if you're a position, it's something that you're looking back at that has happened. So it's there to be uncovered if you get it, if you can actually recognize it. And therefore, it doesn't change because the past can't change. So, well, <laughs> some people can imagine it can. Um, so here we are, the abstract components. This is the second thing I'm going to look at. It is about, um, you might have seen this in my trailer, it's about this, this really fundamental idea in, in type theory that comes from Jung, essentially, originally, where he's saying that these, that these um, Introversion and extroversion are like separate things that he talks about. And the basic functions, basic psychological functions, as you can see here, sensing, intuition, thinking, feeling, they're like these separate components and they combine together. And then you get this, what he calls a modification of the functions by the introversion, extroversion attitude. And as, well, as many people have talked about in other talks, attitude is a much more complex subject. It doesn't mean extroversion, introversion. As, although it has been taken to mean that in the current days. Um, so this is the basic formula. You've got these things, these extroversion, introversion, and these basic functions. Multiply them together, you get these products. You get these eight, uh, eight function attitudes, as they're sometimes called, or um, whatever you want to call them. Now, that's what's been accepted and passed down. But I'm going to put the case that, you know, although Jung writes as if that is the case. He also, being typically Jung, writes about the absolute opposite as well. So depending on which quotes you take, you could take either position really. But um, I'm gonna show you some of the ones that support the idea that actually they aren't really separate entities and, and actually they are abstractions and the eight processes are actually the fundamental. It's important that we know which way around it is. So no one's simply introverted or extroverted, but he is so in one of his functions. So in individual cases, the introverted or extroverted attitudes can never be demonstrated per se. They only appear as the peculiarity of the predominating conscious function. He said there's, there's no free floating introversion, extroversion. They're not a thing out there that you can do. So in, a, in a moment in the state, you don't experience introversion or extroversion separately. They're always like just, a fact that a, a, a particular mental process is turned inwards or outwards or pr prioritizing the inwards or outwards perspective. Um, now, that's why I mentioned the function types here. The introverted and extroverted attitudes can never be demonstrated per se. It's interesting to note that the, a lot of these quotes are from like the 1923 paper and onwards, which is at the back of psychological types. So much of the other perspective I find comes earlier in, in the main book, which he writes kind of 20, 1921 or prior to that. And then, you know, I think as his thinking develops as he goes on, 
he's saying there's no general attitude of the unconscious. It's a very Jungian attitude to take that there is a general attitude that all like the conscious conscious side of the psyche is either introverted or extroverted, and, and there's the, and, and the unconscious is the opposite. He's saying there is no general attitude of the unconscious, only typically modified forms of con unconscious functions. Only through investigating the, the, them, the peculiar, peculiarities and, and unconscious attitudes these signs are established. He's, he's making this case that they're always combined together. And then he's saying, strictly, and strictly speaking, there's no introverts and extroverts, pure and simple, only introverts and extroverted function types, such as thinking, sensing, into et cetera. There's eight clearly distinguishable types. He's putting case forward the case of like eight fundamentals not two and four that combine together, but eight fundamentals. Um, in practice, the four types, the basic functions are always combined, always combined. In practice, what does he mean in practice? I think he means like well, the grounding of Jungian work is not phenomenology. It's like in the moment, in our experience, if we're observing our minds, what's arising and what's manifesting itself. In practice, in the moment, if you say what's happening right now, you, you're going to find these eight demonstrable function types, not some abstracted idea, not some abstracted general um, outward focus of energy towards absolutely every, anything and everything. It's always selective. There's always some, you know, there's some kind of content that you're focusing that, that attention towards. Um, so I like this one. This is coming from the ETH lectures. Um, Sonny Shamsani wrote this in his book, quote from Jung. Jung cautioned the type of the introvert about which he was to speak was not a human being, but an abstraction which could not physically exist. He's talking about abstraction. I speak if the extracts we should get, if you put 10,000 introverts into a retort, that's like a chemical apparatus, and boil them down. He's saying, you know, in, in practice, in reality, you know, you've, always, you've got these things always, always combined, so to speak, or uh, they are in the fundamental form. So it's to warn you about identification. Identification, you know, saying, are you an introvert or an extrovert, for instance, there's a danger in, in, in simplifying it that way because um, you can get caught out. So what I'm saying is like, it reverses the theory as, as been received that actually what, what I'm saying is there's more the case here and Jung's quotes seem to support that. Like I said, although he contradicts himself from other quotes, eight fundamental domains of mental processing. And when you abstract them, when they are abstracted, you get these two types of like extroversion, introversion, and four uh, types of functional process, the basic functions. You know, so the idea is if you've got eight fundamentals, you know, four of them just happen to predominantly um, tend towards the, the, the objective view, the extroversion, the turned outwardness. You know, four of them just happen to, um, to prefer, tend, have a tendency towards the introversion, the turned inwardness subjective experience predominating with that view. Um, but that's just the extra and introversion are just one abstracted quality of what those things have in common. Now this is an analogy to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about and why it's a bit silly to do it that way. Imagine this kind of cake bar here. So this is like kind of nice tracker bar you might take on a hike, something like that. Uh, so imagine that this is like your personality, you kind of, you, as you nibble into it, each nibble is like a moment of your life, um, and, and that changes over time, so in each nibble, in each moment, you're getting a different experience, and then these little ingredients that you can see all clagged together there, they are like different um, mental processes, for instance, and, and each one of them will taste different, experience will be different of each one, so in a certain, if you take a big mouthful, you might get a tell, taste of all of them, like, you know, a lot of them all sort of in a compound state together. If you take a little smaller nibble in a moment, you might notice just, this might just bite into one ingredient and just get the pure taste of that thing. Um, but if you were to look at the nutritional information here, so you've got like the fat, carbohydrate, the protein, protein the fiber, that's abstracted information. Okay, it's taking, it's abstracting the idea, the quality or the, or the, or the the nutrients of, of fat in all its different forms and, and sucking it out and weighing it all up together and saying, you've got, you've got 11 grams in the, in the bar. But if you were to then say, well, what's the, what's the recipe? How was this bar made? That's what Jung's done. He sort of said, right, this is what I'm witnessing in, in, in mental life. Um, what are the components? What's the recipe? What was it made from? 
So and then he's come up with the extra version, extra version, the basic functions. If you were to do that with this, it'd be like saying, okay, yeah, I've got these, these nutrients. Um, I know how it was made. You had a, we had a bag of fat. We had a bag of fiber and a bag of protein on our bench in the kitchen. And we mixed them all together. You'd think that was ridiculous to think that, wouldn't you? But that's what's happened with type. I don't know if anyone's just had a penny drop moment, but like, it's kind of, that is just, it seems crazy to put, to put it in this analogy. That's what's happened. The ingredients are actually more in, in these natural ingredient forms, like sultanas, like glucose syrup, and they're like more like the eight function level. You know, so each one of them might have a bit of fat or sugar or whatever in it. But you can abstract it from it, but they don't exist in the moment in their individual forms. So the implications, what the implications of reversing this like this. So the MBTI chose to assess abstracted components separately rather than eight processes. So it bundles groups of the eight processes, eight functions into categories. Um, and then it makes type dynamics with the eight, working with them as, a, as an add-on to the model. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's something we should just throw that away and not do it, do it. You can use abstractions, but you've got to use it with awareness and caution. You've got to know that you're using abstractions. And so when you come across some of the issues that you do in, in working with type, you realize that's why. Um, now, that's, I'd say that the... Uh, the basic of these components are, are removed from state experience. As I've said, if you watch your mind in the moment, you watch what's arising, you come across something that is feeling like, and you look into it further, you can always determine whether it's introverted or extroverted feeling because they're very different principles, very different sets of values. Okay. So the problems you might run into if you're using the abstraction model is that, you know, you ask someone you know, about their preference, is it extroverted or introverted? But people are not going to be equally disposed to all four extroverted processes when you break them down in the eight-function model. Above all of the introverted ones, there's always some kind of confusion. They're like, oh, a bit extroverted, a bit introverted. I'm like, oh, I, yes, but because <laughs> they're abstractions, because they're only tied into specific mental processes. And the same with, with, with say, with uh, feeling, you know, if somebody's got a feeling preference, um, I'd say that, you know, they're not likely to really relate to introvert and extrovert feeling in the same way. So when you've got one description, it talks about feeling as an overall thing. It's always going to conflate two things and, and put people off partly or confuse them. So I think type should focus towards an eight process model. Um, I don't know if you agree with me, maybe in the chat you can put, you know, is this something you could accept and move on? We could go, right, thank God for that. We've got over that problem. We're not thinking that we've got these bags of fat and sugar on our counter anymore. We can get on with it with it and with a new idea and reverse the theory or not. So you know I, I'm not saying you have to agree with me, but I'm putting this forward out there. And hopefully the more people that listen to this and the more people you talk to about it, the more this idea will spread. Um, so let's get into um, consciousness. I want to spend the rest of the talk on this. Something I haven't really talked about in um, in my other previous talks, but I've been reading, reading a couple of books recently and got more into this. It's a bit of the history of consciousness. What is it and where does it come from? So Max Fellman is, is a really great guy. Um, he's, he's one of our leading UK experts on consciousness, based down in Totnes. He runs a Totnes Consciousness Cafe, which you can join in on Zoom nowadays, actually, which is really interesting. Very interesting speakers. Um, I was lucky enough to meet him once. Um, he's written lots of books on the topic, and he's got these great um, what they call companions to his book on research gates. So if you're at his research gates, you can find these great free papers, which are fantastic resources. Here's some quotes. So he's talking about the founding philosopher psychologists, which is the ground of where our psychology originally comes from. Um, but there was no consistently clear distinctions between what we now think as consciousness, mind, and soul, and the belief that humans may have some spiritual essence that cannot be reduced to their material bodies, Appears to precede recorded history by at least 70,000 years. So this idea of the soul, the thing that, that's there, the assassins that can rise out of the body in a separate. Um, now that's, that's kind of become blended and, and baggaged in with the idea of consciousness over history and time, which lends itself to a bit of a problem when you come to like modern day um, hardcore um, scientists and psychologists who, who really don't like that idea for obvious reasons. Um, now, you know, Descartes was one of the key figures in, in writing about consciousness as well. And he's talking about these two 
substances. He's saying that oh, there's this thing of the mind, this res cognitans, this thing of the physical world, essentially, all the rest of um, reality, and they're separate entities. It's if, like a philosophical, like, ontological thing, which leads to what you call dualist interactionism and the problem of, well, how do those things relate to each other? How does this thing of mind relate to the thing of world? So this, this kind of dualism has, has again become another problem. But if you look at it in a more simple way, more, in modern terms, consciousness can be partly defined in terms of the presence or absence of phenomenal contents. That's phenomenological experiential contents within the mind that you can become aware of in the first person. Um, now, there was the phase in, in psychology where it was called armchair psychology. It was about um, structuralism. I guess Jung kind of fits into this world, really. Uh, it's an introspection. You know, a lot of his work was, was based on you know, deep introspection of his own inner world, but also exploring that of his, his analysis, his patients, his clients, um, and those discussing that with his colleagues and coming up with theories based on it. I mean, introspection it sort of morphed through Hustle and, and other people into like what we call phenomenology nowadays. So it's that first person exploration of the mind. Um, but there was a movement to like overturn and, and discard um, that aspect, that side of psychology, and, and that took the form of behaviorism. So, you know, as early as 1913, now put that into context, Jung's book, Psychological Types, came out in 1921, originally in German. So you've got, you know, just even before that, you've got Watson, who, by the way, as you saw in my last year's talk, gave an awful review of Jung's book. The time has come when psychology must discard all reference to consciousness. And this movement became so powerful, it may, may not delude its, itself into thinking that it's making mental states the object of observation. So from like this sort of time, like around sort of leading up to 1920 till the 1950s, it, it was a, almost the, the main major influence on a lot of, um, especially American and, and European psychology, and especially in academia. You cannot underestimate that like the, the legacy of behaviorism um, and what it's left within the psychology as a field. Um, so here, within academic psychology departments, reference to mind or consciousness in psychological explanations of behavior were commonly regarded as pre-scientific. You know, there was, there was people had a big issue with the whole concept of consciousness. That's a problem for Jung because his, his as we'll see, his, his theory was all about consciousness. So they've removed the entire grounding or basis and discarded it as irrelevant of his work around types. So no wonder it struggled to find its place and be accepted. Um, but it's, it, there was an irony because even though consciousness was seen as like pre scientific and invalid, there's many psychological experiments where people were required to make reports of various kinds on, on their response. So they were, they were reporting their subjective experience, but they kind of <laughs> wrapped it up as a form of verbal behavior. And said, so, oh, it's not subjective experience. We don't like subjective. It's verbal behavior. It's like they were still working with the same thing sometimes, but like denying they were even doing it because they wouldn't even allow themselves that. It's kind of strange. Um, so during these behaviorist years, uh, so consciousness is largely ignored in psychological science. There's a distrust of the subjective. Have you ever seen that? I mean, there's, people still have that today, some people. Merely subjective. Jung wrote about that as well. It was around in his day, but there's a lot of people with distrust um, of, what they, of what their experience of, of the world. Obviously, we don't want to put too much trust in that. You know, we, we, we also want to question it, but um, I think we need to have a little bit more trust <laughs> of our experience of reality, because what else do we have? What else does anyone have, really, at the end of the day? Everything is known through the human mind that we know, really interpreted through it. Um, cognitive psychology came along in the mid, mid 20th century and that investigates states and processes which enables human beings to produce the behavior. They take a functionalist approach. What is something good for? Maybe absolutely nothing, maybe not. <laughs> maybe it's good for something. 
And then there's lots of work around that, like human information processing, this kind of computer analogy, the information analogy. Um, and then, but around 1970, there was this papers start to come back around talking of mentioning consciousness. I guess it had to be quite tentative at the time. Um, and then from the early 90s, so like moving on another 20 years, consciousness studies emerged as a distinct inter interdisciplinary field, own conferences, journals, professional bodies, and textbooks. So, you know, for the last 30 years, consciousness has not been in the shadows anymore. It's a very much a thing, and it's very much a studied science now. So there is a basis and a grounding for, for, for that Jung's work can rejoin, but we've still got the legacy of, of behaviorism. We still see it today, and, and that's part of where we see resistance, I think. Partly because it's been hidden, that the basis of Jung's work has been hidden because it wasn't cool to talk about consciousness. People had to kind of just ignore that, but when you, or discard it from when they're working with type or explaining it. But it's, it's just the theory doesn't really work or exist without that. That is its grounding, that is its basis. So again, removed from its context, type had a major problem. So let's look at Jung on consciousness, um, or at least what he's written in psychological types or collected work six, which is types plus four papers. Um, and then I did search on that. You've got within that collected work six, you've got 1,657 appearances of the word conscious, conscious as a root word. So it could be conscious, unconscious, consciousness, etc. But that on average appears two and a half times each page in this large 651 page book. 1.7 times per, per paragraph average. It's constantly throughout the book. The word conscious, 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 conscious. You can't, if you read it, you, you can't ignore it. It's there. It's so embedded as the, as the basis of the theory. So let's read. I'm going to blast through this. Okay. I don't expect to read all of this, but there's some highlighted bits that you'll see, which are what I'm going to really pick up on. Um, but I'm going to go through all the slides so that you can. Um, pause them on the recording afterwards and, and actually spend some more time digesting. You really do have to chew on Jung a lot. Um, so de definition of consciousness, he defines it as the relation of psychic contents to the ego. He means psychological there, obviously. And the ego, well, we'll look further at what that means, but the relation of it, I mean, you could say one way you could say the ego has been described Describe it once as like a kind of mirror. You know, anything that's reflected off that mirror is conscious. A nice analogy. Um, but he also talks about it as a process, a function or activity, which maintains the relation of psych psychological contents to the ego. It's not just the the relation itself, but like the, something that that kind of maintains that relationship. And he's, and he's saying, obviously, beyond the ego, the psyche as a term. For him denotes the totality of all psychological contents that's conscious and unconscious that's a larger thing and the ego sits within that um so and he says the really fundamental subject of self the the, or the, the self is um is basically related more to the psyche so he's saying that you know, a lot of the time we, we've got the sense that our conscious self is everything it's the, the subject of us of who we are um but he's saying also the greater, broader subject that encompasses the self the, of the conscious and unconscious together. So ego is just defining that as a complex of ideas. Complex goes into this idea of kind of an archetypal core along with contents from life that kind of gathers around it. And a complex of ideas it constitutes the center of my field of consciousness and appears to possess a high degree of continuity and identity. Again, it's a sort of conscious self concept. Um, it's kind of this is who I am, and, and it's kind of continuously who I am over time. But he's saying the ego is just one complex among other complexes. It's just one. So he's saying there are other centers to the mind besides that. And yes, the ego, yet yeah, the ego often thinks it is everything. And um, so my personality parts approach that is, you know, essentially what we're talking about here. There's multiple centers to the mind. Now, he's saying, um, think of the consciousness of a function only when its use is under the control of the will 
the question of will and whether free will even exists is, is a <laughs> hot topic to debate, but um, we can say we at least get the sense of volition that something is that us doing it and we're intending to do something. Um, and at the same time, its governing principle is a decisive one for the orientation of consciousness. So again, he's saying something about being conscious, something being conscious, like for instance, um, extroverted thinking. When extroverted thinking is conscious, its governing principle, you could say, is maybe pragmatism. But the principle of pragmatism is the decisive one for the orientation of consciousness when extroverted thinking is conscious and in dominance. He's talking about the auxiliary function, as we know, and the sort of orientations that that can take, um, being not opposed to the dominant function. Feeling can never act as a second function alongside thinking, for instance. We know all this. It's kind of developed into MBTI. Um, he's saying the unconscious, really important. It's not a philosophical concept of a, of a metaphysical nature. He's not doing a Descartes and saying, like, um, the unconscious or even consciousness is like, this ontologically separate stuff that, that is separate to the stuff of, of, of the physical world. He's just saying it more practically that the, anything, it's a borderline concept, he says. So anything that's not conscious is unconscious. That's all he's saying, basically. So if it's not conscious, it's unconscious. <laughs> and it's psycho, if, it's, if it's as long as it's psychological. Quite a nice simple way to put it. And then within this unconscious world, he's, he's got these, the personal unconscious, like the Freudian unconscious, where you've got the sort of personal um, acquisitions of personal life, as he calls it, experience, queer, like that we gain through our actual lives, that's perhaps been repressed. Um, it's kind of the Freudian view. And then you've got the collective unconscious, which a lot of people think has come to something quite wacky, but it's really talking about the, the inherited structure of the brain, as he puts it here. You know, saying we've all broadly got the same kind of structure of, of the brain slash mind um, in a sort of cognitive architecture kind of way. Um, he calls this the, the collective unconscious, the fact that we've collectively got this, this arch architecture. And then you've got the whole essence of consciousness is discrimination, that one function can be valuable and the other non-valuable. That's really important as a basis around this idea of attitude that we have the superior, the inferior, the, the idea that one thing is, is good and the other one bad, essentially, or one valuable or non-valuable. And that's, that's part of the, the big the problem of time. Um, again, he's talking about the power of will, like so the thing that you find valuable, you will kind of bestow with the power of will onto, you will allow it to, we will actively manifest it and, and express it, or suppress the other one. So the conscious acceptance of repressed functions is equivalent to an internal civil war. He's saying there's a lot of tension going on. And the, the attitude, as I've said, is very important for him to understand. Others, have, like James and Steve, have talked about this at length in their talks, I think, as well. Um, but it's essentially an automatic phenomenon. It's an essential cause. It's a bit more similar, I think, to what we call preference now, or the sense that there's an inclination or a tendency for something causing that to to pull you in a one-sided way towards certain things. So he's saying the unconscious does not mean that a thinking type, for instance, is not conscious of his feelings. You kind of know that there, he's saying, he's saying he knows his feelings very well, so far as he's capable of introspection. You know, he, he can notice them, but he denies them any validity and declares they have no influence over, over, them, over him. So it's important to know when we're working with type that these things are not invisible in the unconscious to us we're very aware that they're there but they're just you know we're saying that they're a bit worthless and, that, and they're not really playing any part of who we are or importance in our lives and they can become what you're calling it like a counter personality again it's on my parts kind of perspective I literally saying you know these aspects are like counter personalities that they're, they're this little mini selves in themselves so orientation every attitude's oriented by a certain viewpoint Thinking actually is oriented by the principle of logic. We talked about that before. Each, each kind of the eight functions has its own sort of principle by which it engages with reality or the way it interprets reality. Um, he's here, interestingly, saying here that so long as the unconscious attitude is not too one sided and too remote from unconscious, he's talking about here degrees 
of, of one-sidedness, degrees of consciousness and unconsciousness. And it's important to know that, that in the model that does exist, there is like, you can be a little bit one-sided or a lot one-sided. Just MBTI kind of takes that down the middle and says, everybody who's even one-sided at all this way, whether it's a little or a lot, is on this side and everyone who's a little or a lot on the other side is, is on that one. Um, so again, be aware of that when you're working with MBTI because you know some people can be a little or a lot, but the instrument doesn't measure that or intend to, it just intends to sort either side. And especially if you're a little one-sided, it can be, that's where the, the nuances come in of helping people to sift it. Um, so account of its relative, so relative repression of the inferior function, saying, you know, it's not completely unconscious, it's partly conscious. But when the repressed functions are undeveloped, embryonic and archaic, as so they're kind of childlike, they're not done very well. And archaic is like, it's almost animal-like, going back to an earlier stage of evolution almost, in terms of conscious, not this higher human form that we are today. Um, and he's saying that they also in the unconscious, they form these complexes and terms of these, again, these kind of autonomous self, little mini selves, he, com he compares them to demons. Um, and, and talks about in the Middle Ages, you know, the idea of possession by demons. I mean, that's a, it's an analogy, but it's something that we may even witness ourselves in, in time to time, little mini possessions. Um, so he's saying that this problem when, when, when the unconscious becomes too suppressed, first of all, you get an exagger exaggeration of the conscious standpoint. It's what kind of MBTI models of stress talk about. We overdo the conscious, the, the superior function, the dominant, but it ends in catastrophe, as he puts it, framing as ridiculous of the conscious attitude. But he's saying that can lead to nervous breakdown, neurosis, or substance abuse, or, or even suicide. He's saying this is very serious stuff. You know, this, it's not just some little model of the conscious unconscious. In his work and his experience, this was life or death for some people. Um, he's saying further down here, at first the inhibition of the unconscious functions can be broken down by increased conscious effort. You can, you can just try harder to use them and access them. But then he's saying the more one-sided they get, the more antagonistic they get, they become problematic. But he's saying overall, like if you know, when, when they're a little bit one-sided, it's a good thing in the sense that they're balancing or supplementing. It was supposed to be there to, to, to as, as a counterweight, as he puts it. So abnormal conditions, this he's called a reversal of value. It's worth mentioning the symbol, because the symbol is this idea that the, the, the unconscious mind produces a metaphorical symbol or idea of, of how that reconciliation might look between this conscious and unconscious. Um, two sides that are in conflict. Um, and he's saying that like, when that's out of control, that can kind of rise up and become a psychological disturbance. Um, this is interesting here that he's at the bottom of the lower quote, he's saying, one sees much in another man that does not belong to his conscious psychology, but is a gleam from his unconscious. And one is deluded to attribute the observe, observed quality to his conscious ego. You know, the, the unconscious isn't invisible, especially if you're watching someone's behavior. It's saying, uh, furthermore here, it's hard for the observer to decide which character traits belong to the conscious and which the unconscious. They're gonna be coming out. And, and this, is, this is where something like John Beebe's model is so useful and powerful to help to sort out. You're seeing unconscious contents and recognizing them for the, and, and recognizing the qualities that they're expressing with. And occasionally the superior function gives the impression of normality, the others, have something abnormal or pathological about them. So often in a very subtle way, in, the, in this way that Phoebe's model helps us with. He's saying everything unconscious is projected. When we apprehend the unconscious as a projection, i.e. What, what we, what we um, see as negative or, or whatever, we, we see it, we push it onto other people. When we strip that away, this false appearance from people or objects, then this can promote truth. Um, it's talking about, again, the archetypes, just the idea that they're like these ways of being that are like kind of abstract, but they're like, they're, in, they're, they're inherited, they're instinctive, and they're like invisible stage managers behind the scene, that kind of directing things, having influence on us to be certain ways. So they clothe themselves in fact, so 
it, the archetypal quality of being trickstery might uh, clothe itself as, as, as a clown in our culture or as a as a um, roadrunner in the cartoon or as or as a jester and you know, whatever you know all these different things um it can't be a matter of conscious this is very interesting that you're saying essentially type isn't a choice what becomes conscious isn't a conscious decision it's, it's something unconscious that's causing the one-sidedness of what's conscious now that's really interesting we kind of know it anyway um talks about disposition that's that's ultimately what's driving us this inclination in one way and that it's falsification of types possible if you don't follow that which can be very dangerous in your development um, i'm gonna have to speed up with this because i've got a lot of other bits to go on to but um i'm just going to skip through these a little bit but the most the essence of this is a dynamic system point of his analytical therapy was to have a realization of unconscious contents so that compensation can be reestablished. He wanted you to explore your unconscious and become aware of it and to give it value. Now, have a little break, have a little breather for a minute. That was a lot of information. I've just picked out all the nuggets that I've found that I took me days going through psychological types, looking at everything, every mention of the word conscious. So, Hopefully I've summarized that I've saved you having to do that annoying searching for yourself. But I do encourage you to look into it and read the book, obviously, maybe 10 times. Just because yeah, that's the only way you can ever understand it. Um, now, onto some modern consciousness. So remember we had that little jump. You know, this, this was young, 100 years ago, talking about consciousness that we looked at before. Remember there was that time of, of hate, hating towards consciousness as an idea in psychology, but then it was reborn in the 90s. And those couple of books I've, I've, read, I've read about summarizing some of that last 30 years, and it's really exciting stuff. This guy um, is based in France, Stanislas Dehen, I think that's how you pronounce it. He's got this book, Consciousness in the Brain. There's the um, citation for it there, um, the reference, sorry. Now, he's, he's got a great book, um, and he says that even when he was a student in the late 80s, he was surprised that during lab meetings, we're not allowed to use the C word. Obviously, he means consciousness there. <laughs> but it's great to put it in that way. And I love the way he's used that phrase. Um, he's saying that, you know, in contemporary science of consciousness, they sort of studying three different areas broadly. You've got this vigilance, that's the state of like how conscious are you? And they and they use that on things like, like coma patients. And there's all this, obviously really, really interesting research into like locked-in syndrome and things where people are conscious, but they don't appear to be. There was some someone who was even um you know, in, in that state, but, but could communicate by blinking an eye. And he managed to, to, to like basically try to, to, to write a book through someone else who, who decoded his eye blinks and, and wrote it into a book, which is inter interesting. Now, then you talk about attention, the focus of mental resources or conscious access. Like, can you attend to something? Are you aware that it's there or not? And, and there's like a threshold of that. And they can manipulate that in experiments and they can make things um aware or not aware it can subliminally put things in at such a short time because consciousness has what's called a refractory period like it kind of it has a, what they call the blink there was a book about that um where something can, becomes conscious the next thing can't come directly into consciousness until the other things passed it's kind of got this little reset period almost So he's talking about in, in modern consciousness, this global neuronal workspace hypothesis. So consciousness is brain-wide information sharing. What's actually happening in the brain when something becomes conscious? So there's this diagram that is drawing at the top here and that. You can see on the left, something is subliminal. It's below the threshold of consciousness. So something kind of propagates a little bit in the brain. This is in the visual area at the back of the brain. Something that a signal comes in there and it kind of, Kind of spreads out a little bit through the neurons communicating it doesn't get much further on the right is when something becomes conscious conscious access it joins this this brain-wide thing it goes boom and it's like wow it goes spreads out and, and starts communicating this information across the entire brain there's actually the the in, in the center and in, in is the um the thalamus which is almost like a little mini brain within a brain at the very core in the center in the brain 
and then you've got the cortex and the highest levels on the outside. And then there's circuits that go between those and throughout the whole thing, between the very center and the outside. And it actually is all related to the field of the, the electromagnetic field of the brain as well, although materialist scientists don't like to talk about that. There's lots of people who have though. And then there's, um, yeah, so there's this, what we call the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex at the back. They're especially involved in this process. So this thick kind of information comes from wherever it does in the brain. It kind of talks to those two and it goes boom and it goes wow. And it, the whole brain kind of lights up and you've got this um, brain-wide information sharing. And there's these different, what they call um, neural correlates of consciousness that they explore. They say, what's happening in the brain? How do we know something's conscious? Um, he says consciousness is similar to the clipboard in the, in the, in the computer. You know, you copy things into your clipboard, saying that this conscious workspace is like the clipboard of the mind, because it can take things and route them between different processes in the same way we can route information between our email and a spreadsheet or something like that, and we can take it from one to the other. Because otherwise our computer doesn't talk between those applications in the same way that processes in the brain might not do. But consciousness allows it to all communicate and pass information on. This is a diagram that shows um, we've got this, got this big web of this global workspace where things go global in the brain. You think, you know, in a conscious thought, will access tap into that and access it. There'll be an initial impulse or stimulus that's strong enough and long lasting enough so that it will go, it will reach out to those areas that then spread it around the whole brain. And then it actually has a feedback. So then the information comes back and it strengthens the original signal and it kind of becomes a loop and it, it goes, you know, that's why it becomes so widespread. There's things what you call pre-conscious. They're things that could be conscious, but aren't because we haven't attended to them. I think that's the, like a lot of the, the, the function, the other functions that are not so conscious. You know, they can, we can become conscious of them, but we're just not paying attention a lot of the time. Um, so there's this barrier here whereby the stimulus is there, but we need to attend to it for it to go global and access consciousness. This, the subliminal weak things, which are too weak, that just can't access it. They don't have the, um, you know, it's like you need enough of a spark to light a fire, don't you, initially? And that's a nice way to put it. If you've got an open fire, you've got to have a fire lighter or something that gives enough heat that it will actually catch to the rest of it and go boom. But it's like there's not enough of a spark there. And then it's disconnected processes like the um, like certain aspects of like breathing and, and regulation of the body that you can never consciously access. We know that the body, we just have to trust the body does it in the background. And then there's these saying there's lots of information and stuff encoded within the network of the brain, which we might not be able to access consciously. Um, they've done some really interesting experiments around that. Um, how they can, for instance, show subliminal pictures of things to people and then scan their brains to see if there's like um, some kind of reaction or hunches to what's that, that's reacted to it that they're not consciously aware of. The, so that that brain scan can tell them that things that the brain has processed that the person can't tell them by reporting it. Um, yeah, we talked about signatures of consciousness. There's a sudden ignition of parietal and prefrontal cortex. Um, that's one of the correlates they notice that when something goes conscious, there's a late slow wave. So a third of a second later, this, this is wave that, that, you know, like EEG that Dario uses in his experiments, there's an electrical wave that passes more slowly over the, over the surface of the cortex. And then there's a later burst of high frequency oscillations like ups and downs in the signal. And of course, distant brain regions being, not just talking about being synchronized, they're working at the same time that they're, they're locked in together. And you know, some people would say that that happens through the electromagnetic field. Because in, in a field, things are unified and they can, they, that's, that's how things can happen. Um, so yeah, this next thing is um, another book that I've read. So the first one was Stan Stanislas de Hen's book. The one I've just finished reading uh, uh, recently is Anil Seth's book. I highly recommend this one as well. Both these books are fantastic. Now, and Al Seth, um, he lives in Brighton, where I live actually, and he at the, works at the University of Sussex. Um, I've not met him yet actually, but I've met some of his colleagues. I was lucky enough to go for a little tour of the department once, and I tried on the virtual reality helmet, which makes you hallucinate dogs everywhere. And that sounds bizarre, but you, you, you see, they've, they've kind of 
programmed a computer simulation of, of a hallucinatory experience. Um, now, he's saying that in the early 90s, in Cambridge, where he first did his first degree um, in psychology and neuroscience, everybody seemed to avoid or even outlaw the mention of consciousness. Now, even in the 90s, you know, that's like the trail of behaviorism and suppression of this stuff lasts so many years. You know, it's, it, and it's like I said, it's still not 100% gone. I think it still hangs on, especially in trait psychology, because of the time and the place when it, it developed, the roots of it are in there and it, it's difficult for it to shake them. But modern consciousness science has to a degree. Um, but I like, I like NL Seth, he's got some good videos, he's got a TED talk out there. He's saying consciousness is first and foremost about subjective experience, it's about phenomenology. And that's really important because I think that's what Jung's psychology was ultimately grounded in. And that's what it needs to come back to. And, and as long as science can valid, like validate and take that as information that it can be used experimentally, then, we're, then it's on. We've got a, we, there's a hope that this can actually be taken somewhere because that's what's been denied for so many decades. And that's why it's found, we found it, types find it so hard to find its place in science. But, you know, Arnold Seth and others, you know, are really seeing at least as, as just information that is, that can be used. That's not wrong. It's just what it is. If someone experiences something, they've experienced it. And you just take that as information. He's what goes, what he calls the real problem of consciousness. There's this thing called the hard problem, which is kind of how does consciousness arise from the material brain? He's saying, let's not worry about that. Let's worry about the real problem, which is um, explaining, predicting, and controlling phenomenological properties of conscious experience. It's interesting going back to the very start when we talked about the soul, like the out of body experience that, that can, that, you know, people do have those, you know, the idea that you can float out of your body and, and that's some kind of, you know, that's for some people, evidence that um, but there is a soul that is separate to the body and that's what you've just experienced. Now, you know, he talks about controlling phenomenological properties. That's making people experience things by doing things to their brain, whether that's injecting a little electric shock or using a magnetic field on it or something, whatever, um, poking it, or whatever you do to the brain. <laughs> making people experience things reliably by doing things to their brain. Um, so you can actually, you know, there are actually, there is actually a region of the brain where they can reliably give people out of body experiences by stimulating it with magnetic fields. So they, you know, they can actually make that happen. Um, and there's lots of many other things. So the whole idea of what Jung called like the subject object boundary that the, the object, the person on the outside cannot ever know your experience or what you're experiencing. This is, it is subjective and only known to you in the first person. That's kind of become blurred now with neuroscience. There's a degree to which they can at least have some idea of what you're experiencing by looking at what your brain is doing. Um, and if you look at people on it, everyone's brain's kind of configured slightly differently because of the way we've developed. But you know, there's even this the experiment where they figured out in, in, in a particular person's brain there was this one neuron that lit up whenever they saw Jennifer Aniston. And only when they saw Jennifer Aniston, that's the only purpose of this, that this neuron had become attributed to. Um, and they could reliably make it light up by showing them pictures of Jennifer Aniston. So, you know, the, the links between what the brain is doing and what we consciously experience is becoming more understood. It's not totally understood. We, they, still, they, they still can't do a scan of your brain and, and, and tell you what you were dreaming about or something in the way that we can report it. Um, so Anil Seth talks about our experience of the world um, as a brain-based prediction. So what we take as this kind of bottom-up experience of reality as it is, it's never as it is. He's saying it's a controlled hallucination. If you look at this, 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 for instance, um, where the name is, Adelson's checkerboard, I think it's called. It's a, it's a well-known um, optical illusion that we think the, 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 the square that's just directly, in, the white square directly in front of the cylinder 
is a different color from the ones that are um, above and below it. You can see when, when, when it's put into perspective, they're actually this, the same color. It's just our brain infers, it predicts. He's talking about Bayesian best guesses using, using Bayesian types of prediction as a type of statistical prediction of what might happen. So it's iterating over and over. Our brain's always trying to guess what will happen or what, what is the cause of what's out there in the world. But it's, 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 there's this process of prediction error minimalization. So our predictions are then tested against the sensory input that's coming against it. And, and there's this kind of creation of the world between those two things. Um, interesting, like when I saw Steve Miser's talk a while ago, um, talking about essay in anima, which is this philosophy that Jung talks about, which is kind of the same thing. You know, the reality is created through this kind of subjective um, input and the, on the objective uh, um, data. It's, you know, there's this kind of combination of the two. Seth's beast machine theory of consciousness is about, um, you know, that, that we, we experience what we experience because of our bodies. Yeah, two minutes to go, we're nearly there. Um, and there's these different kinds of self, uh, which we can go into later, but, but they're kind of, some of these things coincide with what Jung was talking about, the narrative self of who we are, but then there's the volitional self, that's the sense of will that we were talking about before. So anyway, that's my final slide, bang on time, hopefully. Um, what can we take from all of this? Um, it's an ongoing thing. We've got to just look at all this deeper and deeper, I think. And um, you know, hopefully um, you're on the journey with me. You know, let, let's 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 up our game and, and um, you know start integrating more of these things together and take this somewhere. Um, we've got to clearly define types of what, otherwise we've got just a confusion from the start. We've got to be aware of abstraction. You know, know it for what it is, and you can work with it if you want, but in the in the way that it works. Established scientific research grounding in phenomenology of context, con conscious contents. I think, you know, I, I know this one person here who's a, who's a student and looking to explore this thing. I think this is where type will find its home to under, understand and validate it. It's just it's bringing it back to the psychology of consciousness. And we can do that, that now. You know, we're not like crushed by, by behaviorists. They, you know, to a degree, like the, the, there is the space to do it. Now, if you've got any thoughts on this, contact me via the forum on personalityparts.com. We can have a little discussion now if you want after the recording stops. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Remember to breathe, relax. Thank you very much. So thank you very much indeed, Richard. Um, I, I think to kind of echo what you said at the beginning, certainly one to go back and listen to again. So I will get the recording um, uploaded um, as quickly as possible and it will be on the, uh, on the conference website. So we're now on three o'clock. I'm going to stop the recording.